Hey, welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. It's the last show that we're going to be uh, taping from here in Jerusalem for a while because I'm coming uh, to America. Uh, But uh, I wanted to talk to you guys this week or want to have a guest to talk about what's happening in the IDF. Um, The news in Israel is inundated. Like the first 20 minutes of every news program in Israel is starting with what's happening in the Air Force, what's happening in the Air Force, because you have all of these retired old Air Force pilots who are organizing now uh, and threatening that if the government passes its watered down little tiny law uh, denying judges in the Supreme Court the right to overturn Knesset laws and government policies because the gov- because the judges claim that it's unreasonable. Literally, I'm not kidding. They're, they're trying to strip away the reasonableness clause, which is made up right? Uh, It's not based on law. It's based on what uh, navel-gazing justices decide when they look at their belly buttons and they figure out what's reasonable and unreasonable with absolutely nothing to do with the law. So the Knesset is on Sunday, next Sunday, supposed to pass a law that uh, constrains justice, constrains, doesn't cancel, which it should be doing, the justice's ability to uh, cancel laws or government policies based on this completely arbitrary uh, measure of of uh, reasonableness, and for that, the the left, uh, led right now by a contingent of retired uh, pilots from the Air Force, are going to war, and they're saying we're going to tear apart the army. You're going to be faced uh, on my way here to Jerusalem to tape this episode. Amit Segel, the political correspondent for Channel 12, reported that the heads of the protests, which are just the you know, commanders of this uh, left-wing insurgency have a list of 20,000 pilots and special forces operators who are going to sign this petition saying that they will not serve in the IDF if this law is passed. So this is their plan. They're going to the mattresses, just like in The Godfather, and they're saying that democracy thing's very cute, but uh, we pilots, we're the ones in charge. So my guest this week uh, is major IDF major or IAF, Israel Air Force major, Shai Kalaf. So, because he's been sort of leading the counter charge uh, among Air Force pilots against what's happening. So first of all, Shai, welcome to the Carolyn Glick Show. Thanks for being my guest here. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. See, he's worried about his English, but I'm telling you, it's going to be fine. You're going to be fine. You, you know, you're going to, uh, he's already off to the races, right? It's a great start. Anyway, so Shai, um, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. So, uh, tell 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 the tell tell our audience a little bit about what what uh, how how you came to be uh, in this position of leading the counter charge against all of these Air Force pilots. Okay, mm-hmm. Okay, um, so you know, I was writing a book. I I was born in kibbutz, you know, so. You're doing great. You're doing great. Okay. okay. So I was born and raised in a kibbutz, Kinsar. It's a secular kibbutz on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's and beautiful, by the way. It's gorgeous. Yeah. To Kim Perodesh, because you know, so I could see, like, you know. Anyway, I was volunteered to the to the Air Force and then uh, served for almost ten years uh, as a combat pilot. Um, in the F-16s. In F-16s, yeah. And I had also the privilege to be an instructor in the flight academy. And a great privilege to be the commander of the of the flight academy officers course at the flight academy. And since then, I think that I had been, you know, thinking about the chuva process. Now, in perspective, I can see that it's a chuva process. But you know, it took me almost ten years to to try to answer, to start to answer the questions of the meaning of the life and the truth. Because I was raised in Yigal Alon kibbutz. Yigal Alon was the the higher uh, general in Minchemet uh, Tashas. Right, uh, Yigal Alon was the uh, IDF uh, top commander in in uh, the War of Independence in 1948, and this was his kibbutz. So you're really in the cradle of labor Zionism. Yeah. At uh, kibbutz Kinnasim. Exactly, and not just that. I but. You know, I was raised with the three main perceptions, the foundations of the Zionism. I mean, uh, it Yashvut. Settlement. Uh, settlement. Aliyah. There is no transit. Aliyah. Uh, it's Aliyah. Gathering of ex- exile. Yeah. The- and uh, and Bitachon, security. You know, those three principles. And 
when I had the privilege to be the commander of the officer's course at the Flight Academy, we had a cooperation with the with the regular officer's course in uh, Badikhat. And then I realized... That training, training base number one, that's where uh, officer training course takes place. And then I realized that suddenly the religious Zionism took my principles because I saw there that almost for 10 years, 40% of the graduated are, are, uh, are, are, are uh, religious. Yeah. 40% of the graduates of officer training yeah. in the IDF are, are Orthodox. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tried to ask myself how, uh, how it comes, how could it be? And then I realized that there is... Does religious Zionists make up what percentage of Israeli society? Like 10? 15? No, no, no. I think... Uh, actually, I didn't know exactly, but we have to check that. Sir, but a very low percentage, of course. And, you know, I found myself one time in, uh, how do you say, Konenut in the squadron, in the operational squadron, mm -hmm. just one year after I was graduated as a, an operational pilot. You know, it takes today five years to be an operational pilot. You have three, three years of uh, the flight academy course, and then you have the first operational training, then the second, secondary. And then you reach to the to the operational squadron F-16 or F-15, today also F-35, but it takes five years. And I, I did the the course of uh, of two years, so it took me it took me four years. And just one year after the operational uh, training, I found myself in uh, Konenut. Well, that means readiness. Uh, you're on alert. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're on alert. You know, it, it, it calls Konenut Yerut, uh, interception, uh, 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 reading of... Um, alert. Alert, yeah. And it was, I think, one year or two years after the of the 9-11 events. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to to guard the, the southern border of Israel. You know, we had the line of 80 miles. Mm -hmm. um, and when the, well, the enemy, you know... Not just an Emin, but also, how do you say, Matos Tovelano. Matos no Sam. It was a cargo, sh a cargo plane. Yeah, a cargo plane who, who, who made warm with his uh, route and he penetrated this line of 80 miles from Israel. Mm -hmm. And then we were intercepted to, to intercept it. We were, was now we were alerted to. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Um, I, I just want to say, Tau Chud Zahag, Achanak, Kem Sapasipu. But we intercepted him, and and when I fly back, it was the Lela Seder. It was the eve of the Seder. Yeah, and it was the eve of the Seder, and you know I was secular there then, and I thought to myself on after we intercepted the, the cargo plane, that I, I suddenly realized that the 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 people of Israel um, wasn't born in 1948. As I learned in, uh, you know, was born with Lerton. No, there was, uh, there is great heritage, a great tradition of the Israeli people. And anyway, I'm, I'm going back to the. Uh, so that was when you began sort of your your journey to yeah. you know, uh, the life that you live today, which is essentially as a as a religious Jew. So that's very learned, natural and tall. So I made a Chuvah process and have been learning for 12 years. I have been learning for 20 years. And then in the last two years, I, uh, I got out of the yeshiva and starting, started to, you know, write articles and give some lectures and to teach some Torah um, and mainly to write my book. And my book is trying to deal with the with the Israeli society, uh, in, you know, direction and uh, uh, direction of thinking, of thoughts, and and suddenly this uh, major event, the climatic event of refusal, uh, appeared. And so you're you're you've spent you spent seven years or nine years in the Air Force as a as a fighter pilot and as a flight instructor in in flight school, and then you left the Air Force to try to figure out what this is all about. You went to Yeshiva. So actually, your name is probably not Major Shaikal, it's Rabbi Shaikal. No, I'm not a rabbi. 
Well, uh, you are for me. So uh, you you were in the yeshiva, you were studying for nine years, you came out, and now you're writing a book, basically exploring from a sociological perspective what exactly. what uh, exactly. Israel is about. And exactly. suddenly we have this insurrection that's being led by your former colleagues in the air. Yes. Yes. So I found myself, you know, I, I was called, I thought by, you know, like a divine call. And, you know, there is an expression in Hebrew, a mitzvah she'ina yechola litkayim l'decher. That's something that you personally were called to do. Yeah. So uh, I started to, you know, to make some interviews, and it came to an epoch in a period of time that uh, it was, you know, twice, maybe three times a day. And, you know, I, l- I had a privilege to lead the, the petition of the former uh, combat pilots who can uh, get to be an active pilots again, and also the technicians uh, petition. The which petition? The technicians. Yeah, the technicians, the flight mechanics, yeah. the ground crews petition. So, so I had a privilege to write it, and you know, it was as to no, and the prime minister also said that what you did was extremely important. And, 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 oh, well, it's okay. Um, so, no, the point is that, I mean, so just to back up. So what happened was you, you found yourself in the midst of all of this, and you realized that you had to come out and speak out against this. Because I think what's most important to point out here is that these people are actually saying, we have Israel by the throat. That if we don't serve, yeah. then there's no army, and Israel isn't going to be ready for war. And it worked. The first time around, when you first started your your efforts, um, it was the threats of the of the reservists not to serve, particularly in the air force and in some special forces unit, that forced mm-hmm. Prime Minister Netanyahu to stand down at the last minute and say, "Okay, we're not going to continue with the legislation. We're going to go to the." president's house, like this group therapy session at uh, Herzog's house, and we're going to try to reach an agreement with the people who just lost the election when they were running on a platform of of opposing judicial reform, and we ran on a platform of advancing a judicial reform. So now we're supposed to talk to the people who are completely opposed to what we did, were defeated because of their opposition, in part. And uh, we're ready to suspend everything, and it was all done when people call it a military coup, and that's not that far from the truth, I don't think, because the IDF has done nothing to discipline any of these people, um, and uh, and it was done by the defense minister who gave a primetime press, t- uh, press conference when Netanyahu was in London, and it was still Shabbat in London, saying that he totally opposes going forward. It's going to destroy the army. It's endangering Israel's security. And uh, and and Netanyahu has basically left, uh, you know, holding the bag. And so these people that are now, again, uh, ratcheting up their campaign of refusing to or- refusing orders, refusing to serve in the army, uh, they're back at their old tricks. So you, you came in the first time around, and because I think everybody was kind of in shock, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, came this guy, Saikala. So everybody's serving. I think that it succeeded at the beginning, at the first time, in the first wave, not because it was a truth. You know, we are dealing now with, uh, I would say, a psychological welfare. Um, but I think that before we are uh, going to deal with the refusal, we, fi- we have to differentiate between, I would say, the virtual reality and the actual reality. Okay, so we can see now, and I think that those days, you know, the second wave objects us about the first wave. Okay? Uh, the, the people who are, you're, you're calling them objectors to service, right? I think it, you know, it points out the, the first wave. How, how was it? You know, oh, the, so the f- second wave is showing us what happened in the exactly, first wave. Exactly, exactly. I mean that today we can see that we have almost daily, maybe, you know, every two days we have a letter. You know, it's a letter of kind of operational uh, uh, headquarters that not even exist. And, you know, without any names, just, you know, the first letters, the initial letters, the initials. Yeah, the initials. And 
These are anonymously signed group letters by people claiming to be pilots, claiming to be special forces operators, claiming to be all kinds of whatever special unit uh, reservists. And they're without their names. They're just anonymous with, uh, you know, my if, if I were signing it, it would be, you know, CBG, right? Signing it as opposed to my name or CG. And and same with you, you'd be you'd be SK. So it's all these these initials, and nobody will tell you who they are. And not just that, but also without any representers, you know, presenters that can be interviewed in the and it always published by the same reporters. So this is the method, okay? And I had last week an interview with Doctor Davidovich. Do you yeah. know? So he is the. Uh, is the one who, you know, initiated the doctor's petition. Have you heard about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's true. I forgot to say that among other people who are now uh, threatening not to serve are physicians. The physician's union literally is saying that they're not going to to care for the ill if, if uh, this stupid little piddly law to restrain the justice's ability to say that... Uh, you know, a, a, a government policy is unreasonable because these unelected judges, you know, think that it's not right, that it's not, that, that it can't go forward. So I prepared myself to, you know, to, to attack him severely. And I, I asked him in the beginning, please tell me, if you have, you know, a patient lay, lay or lay? Lay. Lay, lay on your bed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you treat him? So he told me, of course. So I asked him, what, what is your petition about? What, what are you trying to say? You're trying to, to threaten him? Threaten? 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 Mm -hmm. threaten? To threaten the, the public. What, what are you trying to do? So it's not real. It's a fake. And I think two days later, I had, no, a day, day later, the, in the end of Shabbat, in, in uh, Leon Shishi, in Friday. I had an interview in the uh, Channel 12 with uh, the lead Gutman and Yavli Mo, and I spoke to one of the elders of the Air Force, you know, who signed the petition. His name is Udi Uri, you know, the one who was hurt in his eye by the Maktazit. He got, he got a poo-poo uh, in his eye, and for that we're now, you know, hearing about all of his martyrdom, right, because this, this, uh, this uh, pilot was hurt in his eye. You know, you, you're, you're talking... When you talk about it, it's so crazy, right? Because the amount of violence that the police use against people on the right, you know, Ovia Sandak's friends who were demanding justice when he was killed by police, they were just yeah. beaten brutally and, and brought in chains to the police stations and to, to their arraignment hearings. And obviously the ultra-Orthodox, doesn't matter, men, women, children, just, but this guy, he got a boo-boo in his own. Yeah, so, uh, it, it hurts me. Truly. And, but I asked him, please tell me, how old are you? So he told me 67. So you and I know that you haven't been flying for at least 16 years. So uh, I think that he was one of the youngest of those who signed uh, the truly petition of the ex Air Force pilots. So they're all retired yes, people. Yes, all retired. So this is how the petition, this is how the propaganda looks like. And they okay. sign anonymously to yeah, make you think that they're stopped. And sometimes anonymously. And when they want to, you know, use the Air Force, ex Air Force commanders like Halutz and Shkedi, you know, they use the names. And and the climatic climatic event was with my friends to the to the fight course, fight academy course. His name is Eran Schwartz. He's the head of the propaganda. Yeah, he's the head of their struggle. Yeah. He's he's the, it's... yes, he's uh, he's the. He's the uh, chief of staff or the head of, yeah, the chief of staff, I guess, of, of their struggle committee or whatever. So he got interviewed in Ophir and Berko show. I don't know. I think Channel 13. I don't know. No, it's Channel 11. Uh, maybe Channel 13. Anyway, they're, they're screamers. They're squawkers. And any right winger yeah. guys who comes on to their show is really, I think, walking into the lion's den. And, and, and you deserve what you get when they yell at you because they're, they're animals. Yes. So anyway, he was presented there as a combat pilot as an active one and she asked him and you were there no i was there but my wife showed me the 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 interview mm -hmm. in motsai shabbat and i told her what what he's all about is is not a combat pilot is a transportation pilot first and foremost a combat pilot secondly 
he hasn't been flying for at least 10 years. So he, she asked him, why are you crying? So he, you know, he, he just made a manipulation and express himself as, as a pilot is about to, to quit his uh, active. Uh, so it's a whole, it's a, it's a stage managed uh, exactly. play. And I mean, it's all fiction. It's, it's a, much, it's a fictia fiction. And so this is, I think the virtual reality. Now we can talk about the actual reality. So, okay. So I just want to, I just want to go back to say what you said. So what we're seeing, and you pointed this out and you obviously more on that show with Garit Gutman, the, the woman who said that, that religious Jews suck their blood. Um, he, he started attacking you and saying, you said, look, these people aren't active duty pilots. This isn't, this isn't real. And he said, I, you know, I'm not a pilot. I've only been a military correspondent for these uh, 35 years, and I know everybody. And what you're saying is not true, right? I mean, he tried to deny what you were saying, and then I, I couldn't watch it anymore, so I turned it off. What, what, what? <laughs> how did you respond to that? Yeah. So, I think there was a, a, a lot of bilbul. There was a bit of a confusion. Yeah, there is a bit of a confusion there in the interview because there was. Um, uh, a conference of 400 pilots, active pilots, by they didn't want to refuse. You know, they were uh, settled, they were called by Amir Eshel just to hear about the reform. But Amir Eshel is a former Air Force yeah. commander who was Benny Gantz's and, and uh, director general of the Ministry of Defense when he was deployed. I'm Minister. very glad that you mentioned it because this is part of the of the fi of the fiction. I mean that you know there is an expression in Hebrew called alete ena. Yeah, they're the fig leaps. Yeah, that, it's also many you know, leaps. They came, they came to hear about the reform. They, they came to hear about uh, the judicial reform, and then the those manipulators use it to 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 frighten the the public. So it, right, they had to say, hey, four hundred pilots were about to 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 refuse to to serve. Answers. They brought four propagandists for the left's campaign against the judicial reform to speak with them. Avichaim Bertoblit, the former attorney general, who was the one who concocted all of the fake indictments against Netanyahu, and also said that we're on the verge of no longer being a democracy if this passes. I mean, pure nonsense. Roni al Sheikh, the former police commissioner, who was just exposed as a liar who did wholesale use of uh, of counterterrorism. Who has the Guyava allergy. Right. Spy, spying technologies against Netanyahu's top aides and his and his pair and his children and wife. Okay. Completely illegal. Right. And he's the one who's talking talking to four hundred pilots about the legal reforms. And then Susie Navot uh, from the Israel Democracy Institute, which is one of the organizations on the far left that's been pushing the whole anti reform thing. And well, it's naive, right? I think uh, another professor who's totally, you know, an activist. Uh, I knew about Mandelblit and also Al Sheikh, but so this is all about. And that's all they had. So it wasn't actually a conference on the legal reform. It was an indoctrination session to try to get these 400 pilots to walk away but from the. We have to understand carefully that those pilots are very, you know, uh, you know, value people. They're important. They're they're good. They're very good. They have melachavets, uh, mamash. The salt uh, of the earth. Yeah, they was uh, misled. Yeah, they were misled. They were misled. So anyway, so if we are about to speak about the virtual reality, we can see that Tzal deny those letters. You know, the word Tzal doesn't prove the, the IDF spokesman. Yeah, the IDF spokesman doesn't prove those letters. What do you yeah. mean doesn't prove those letters? Doesn't say the, he, he the, didn't see the, the, invent, the invented letters, you know, that no one uh, really, uh, you know, sign about, sign on, just by initials. And they are not known initials, um, even to the uh, even to the decision makers. Yeah, decision makers. So, um, so this is first and foremost about the truth. And I think that secondly, I would like to say that at the beginning on the first wave, and now also in the second one, we, my colleagues to the form of, uh, forum of uh, pilots to good, the Semlatov against refusal, we spoke with all the uh, combat squadron commanders and they told us there is no one form of refusal. You know, they're pilots, 
who are at the age of 84, 85, about the age of 50. By the way, we have to understand that at the age of 51, the pilot cannot serve anymore as an active one. Okay? Active or active? Active, yeah. They can't, they don't fly anymore. They, they stop flying. So, you know, always that the forms of refusal that we can see and notice comes from those pilots who are in the age of 48 or 49, you know, and there is no an actual refusal and there won't be in a war. We have to know that. There won't be any form of refusal in a war. Um, we have, Baruch uh, Hashem, uh, uh, the very, very good people. And I can... What everybody's claiming, though, is that, you know, pilots have to go in weekly for training flights. That's their that's their reserve duty. It's not that, you know, if you're an infantry soldier, you get called up for 30 days Ooh. or whatever. But if you're a pilot, you get called in. You have to maintain your... Readiness, your yeah. flight readiness. You have to maintain your readiness and you have to fly once a week. Once a week. Yeah. So... So these are so what what the claim is that if they refuse to come for their weekly training, no, but you have a red line of ready. of one month or two months. You know th there are red lines for depends on the uh, 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 on the on the form of you know and the, the, of the, 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 the qualifications. But anyway, we have we I have a proof of that in Mivitzam again Wachetz, in Shil and Aero yeah, operation. in whatever was called, the last one that we did yeah. against Islamic the Jihad. The worst 100% of um, Etihad yeah, Swords. Everybody who was called up, K, okay. 100%. Bidiuk. So now we have to understand that we are situated, we are in the midst of a psychological warfare. This is all about, I, I mean that the head of the petition, the chaos agents, agents sent their reporters um you know that reports without any um how do you call it ethical um well, they don't care about the truth yeah the journalistic ethics i know, you know they break it uh, the, the, uh, degraded maybe the the journalistic ethics we don't uh, have media in Israel. You know, we have propaganda. As a journalist, you can you, you, you can yeah. share with us that we you have to first and, and foremost check you know the sources and then the names and you have to uh, develop kind of uh, I would say you know a, a critical sense okay and they lost it mm -hmm. so this is all about now we can speak about the refusal okay if so no, yes absolutely so because let's just set it up a second so the point is is that you know. Almost, uh, I'm actually been surprised by the velocity of of the return of this uh, phenomenon in the news. Right where you see that uh, every news show essentially has been opening for the past how many, like a week, I think, with these pilots and special operators, and um, and they're trying to drum up panic yesterday and. And after we talk about what's actually happening, I want to move to what the IDF is doing because then the but it seems like the general staff is sort of going along with this. Yesterday we had uh, on Sunday night uh, a secret meeting that was immediately reported to the media, so it wasn't at all secret. They pretended it was secret. They said that the that the uh, Minister of Defense Yoav Gallant and Herzl Levy, the Chief of General Staff of the IDF, and I think the Air Force Commander Tomer Bal and and other high commanders were meeting to discuss the threat of these refusers and, and what they mean for Israel's national security. And again, this was like, we're back in March. We're, we, you know, it's four months have passed. We sat with these endless discussions of nothing in the president's house. And boom, uh, uh, they're going to pass this little piddly uh, law on Sunday, and we're back at the brink where the, the these uh, people are trying to tear apart the army, and the IDF, rather than standing up to them, is catering to them. So, but let's talk about the army in a second. But this is the buildup. Now it's the same buildup. So, what's actually happened? So, uh, I think that well, once we uh, differentiated between the virtual reality and the actual reality, I think that the I think that the Ramatkal, the, the chief of staff, chief of staff. He, he doesn't understand, you know, you can say he's one, he, he's part of the coup. I, I, I don't say it. I think that he he, he doesn't understand, uh, you know, completely the the damage of the psychological warfare. This is all about, I think that the purpose 
you know, one of the goals of the army is not just to supply, you know, security to the citizens of the citizens of Israel, but also to 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 supply them to to enrich them with um, with a feeling of of peace, of tranquility. And this is all about. You have to deal with it. You have to uh, to establish, uh, uh, you know, um, a special unit who will will fight this psychological warfare. And but you mentioned the threat, and I think that um, we have to understand the differentiation between refusal and threat of refusal. But first of all, let's call the child by his name, the boy mm-hmm. by his name. Okay. So this is a refusal. You no, know, they try to. Uh, to call it uh, eat not vote. Or, yes, we're not going to volunteer. We're not going to volunteer anymore. We are not going to lead it anymore. But anyway, one because uh, they're saying they're saying that uh, just to be clear. So when a when a normal IDF reservist gets called up for reserve duty, he gets a command yeah. in order to come. You leave the army, and you're required if you're an infantry man to serve until you're forty, I think, in reserves or tank guy, um, and you get your you get your call up orders yeah. and you're required to come. So in the Air Force, for whatever reason, either you have to you have to volunteer, and it's referred to as volunteering to come to your flight readiness. Uh, you know, weekly weekly flight. Uh, I don't know why that is, but now there there's it's a there's procedure of you know that it depends that on the fact that you have to to come once a week, but you know. We have to understand that one who was, uh, you know, put on a, on a guard duty, uh, and he, he refused to come and he refused to, to serve and he abandons his his post. His post, yes. So he's thrown in jail. Yeah. So he court he, he refused to an order, you know. Okay. So this is your refusal. And now, I, I saw last week the, the Hezbollah mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, published. Uh, I think what was uh, what was published in Galei Tzal. In so, army radio. Yeah, so we can see that the deterrence of Israel was damaged. Okay, and I'm asking simply, my mother has just... Uh, she, just she just had a heart surgery. Well, we watch Lemon. It's not a shame. She had a heart surgery. So, you know, I think that the main the main critic damage of the refusal, it's the re'ut, I would say, maybe the yeah, fellowship. The yeah, fellowship, the, the, sense fellowship. Of, uh, the sense of the esprit de corps of the, of the army. So yeah. it simply says, you know... Your mother is ill. You have a two two years boy in, in your house who barely speaking, okay? Barely speak. Barely speaking yet. Barely speaking yet. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm fine. saying to you, I'm saying to you, if you don't get my agachamot, I don't know the politics, I don't know. If you don't, if you don't cater to my political yeah. wishes, yeah, so I won't protect you anymore. Right. So this is all about, and. Now we have to understand that the threatening it's much more severe than the refusal itself. And why is that? We have a rule in the Gemara that the one who marim yad, the one who threatened someone, is uh, it's more severe than to 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 hit them. And why is that? So I who was hit. He got his uh, slap. So that's it. And the one who threatened someone, he would like to cause him. A, a severe damage by his uh, a psychological um, manipulation. Manipulation. I mean, it's like I remember back years ago before he, he went crazy and whatever. But Mayor Dagan said to me before he became the the commander of the Mossad when he was still on the right and everything and, and rational. And he said that he prefers Hamas to Fatah. And I said, why? And this was, you know, the height of all the suicide bombings and everything. And he said. Because with Hamas, everything's out there. And Fatah always pretends that they're not doing what they're doing. They're blowing us up, and they're pretending that they're our peace partners. So at least with Hamas, you know, nobody can pretend away who they are. And with Fatah, it's also the sense of extortion. You're being extorted. It's confused. Which means that maybe you can avoid the blow if you if you bow to them, right? That's, that, that's why it puts, it blames the victim for the blow that the other person is threatening to to give them and, and, and will anyway, one way or another, you know? Yeah, so anyway, I think that if we come to, this is a proverb, of course, but, you know, I think that they there is a kind of 
a minority tyranny who's threatening, you know, or threatening to on those millions of citizens who did not chose them, didn't choose them. Is they're telling us didn't choose them. We're, yeah, we didn't choose them. We oppose them, and we we have our children, and now they're telling us, look, you know, Hezbollah can 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 attack your kids, and we're not going to protect you. We're endangering your elderly mother. We're 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 threatening your children. We're threatening you. We're threatening your lives because we don't like the way the government is operating. And if they don't change their ways, then your kids are going to be. Uh, under threat, and if you don't, if you want to protect your children, then you better tell Netanyahu and his ministers that they have to shelve the the legislation that they were elected to to advance to pass. So, so that that's exactly what they're saying. Nice family you got there. It'd be a shame if something happened to it. Yeah. yeah. To be more specific, I think that they are threatening, you know, by the power of the army that was given to them. They're threatening to paralyze the country, as as you mentioned at the beginning. That this is a coup. Yes, yeah. a coup. Okay, um, this is all about. And how dangerous do you think the threat is? I think there is no threat. I know the names. There are only three pilots who will refuse Khalila. It won't come to that. I think so. But if it comes to that, there will be only three pilots. We refuse. Um, you know, they're people, you know, who, who have values. They're people who are moral people, moral upstanding friends, people. My friends, I know them. The people who have values. They want uh, that skill. All these, uh, they're not going to abandon this country. They're, they're not going to abandon the country, of course. And, and, and that's it. I think that the, the media, has the obligation to stop those uh, forms of frightening, and this is it. So you think that this is an empty threat? That it, and and I think that there's been a lot of uh, demonstration recently that you know the people who are behind all of these letters are actually uh, public relations firms that are writing them, that are designing them, that are directing them as a form of psychological warfare against the Israeli people. So how do you think if you were, if you had to give, if you had to give out a grade, how is the, how is the government handling yes. this? How so, do you look at so I, the way that the government is handling it? This is what I tried to say. I think that first of all, first of all, we need to understand the situation. Okay. There is a psychological warfare and we have to deal with it. And, and secondly, we, you know, the, I think also the prime minister, there is no law deal with the threatening of refusal. One who called for refusal, you can deal with him. There is a law for that. Also the head of staff, the chief of staff, he has no, you know, um, tools. He has no tools for that, uh, but we have to, uh, enlist or oh, not enlist the, 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 the we have to uh, we have to legislate yeah we have to legislate a law dealing with these forms of threatening and you know and to come to the privation of uh, ranks and you know to take the wings and whatever a normal state would have done to in order to to stay alive you know and i think now they are in joy of the luxury of those decision makers that doesn't deal with it they don't have the luxury of not dealing with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, when you ask me, I think there will, I'm sure there won't be, but if there will be any form of actual refusal, it's really a very, very small damage. You know, three pilots, even five pilots, even 10 pilots, it's a damage, but it's a small one. But to continue with this form of protection, you know, to, of extortion. You know, of extortion and to lishot. How do you say lishot? Yeah, to extort. To extort, to extort the, 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 the government. Public. Yeah, the public and the government. It has to come to an end. I agree with you. You know, we were, all, all, all the years, I'm sure you, you grew up in, in Kibbutz Genosar with the same sense that the Israeli Air Force was just the greatest thing in the world, that our pilots, they, the, the, the recruiting, the recruiting slogan for uh, for the pilots' course is "Hatovim the best to 
to flight school. That's why we call it to our phone, Tayasim Latov. What's that? Oh, that's what you're... Yeah, contrary to the... Yeah, you're saying the pilots must do good. So this is a... The, the good to the good to flight uh, to, to to pilot school, and there's always this sense. But I think that if any, you know, what do they call it? Crisis communications firms. Those are people who come in when your name has been completely ruined, you know, and and wrecked. You've destroyed your reputation, or if you commit a criminal acts, or whatever, you know, it comes up a lot in in the public relations business. I mean. I can't think of any single brand in Israel that has done more damage to itself than the Air Force in the last year. I mean, why would it? it and I don't know. I mean, there are two two things that I think about when I look at the way that they're behaving. The first one is, um, uh, do they like do these people who are are taking you know a machete to the Air Force? Do they have any? Uh, any understanding of the damage? Are they? Are do they just hate Israel? I mean, do they have no idea what they're doing? They they claim, you know, their whole their whole identity is wrapped up with the fact that they're that they're pilots, yeah. and and yet they're just destroying the reputation of the Air Force. You know, I'm torn with that, and I saw in Independence Day there were a lot of people who told me that they don't want even to to think about the matas. Right. I mean, every Independence Day, I think we might have talked about this on the show, you know, that, that you have overflies of all of the towns and villages in Israel of Air Force pilots, and they do all of their suds, and they fly in, in formations, and, and it's really cool. And everybody would, you know, 30 years ago when I was living in Tel Aviv, you know, everybody go to the, the uh, beach and watch it across the coast and even now in in judea and samaria they come over the communities and people just didn't didn't leave their houses they didn't want to see it and i think now they have the obligation to fix it and i think that it will be it will be fixed by the people i think there are kind of there are things that has to rise up from the people not from the from the public or from, from the from... public yeah because there is a, there is a situation of an elite, of what? An elite, elita, of an elite, yeah, of an elite who you know, kind of lost his um, obligation to to serve, and you know to be there is a serve elite, can elite I'm sure that's it. a serving a serving elite, a serving elite, who is you know it's it's a very it's a very leading power in 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 every country, and now once they lost it. We have to, you know, in Fazal there is an expression that um, yeah, that but, the generations is there's a you know passing the baton from generation to generation. Yeah, so we cannot find, for example, a, a, a Rambam or, or Ramban. Or, oh, and it, no, actually, I mis I mistranslated said the the things just get. People get less good from generations. Not just less good, but less like, smart. Right. See, this this is the the the, the great the, uh, the the big descent of the generations. Even generation. like there's yeah. no Maimonides yeah. in today's Jewish world. So Rabbi Ku Zatzal explains that it rises from the public, rises from the people. Okay. So that the elites are going yeah. down, but the the commoners, the great bulk of the Jewish people. Are getting smarter, and that, and then you exactly. get to a convergence and, between the two. And I'm taking this proverb to the uh, to the serve elite, the serving elite of the country. Now the serving elite comes and rise up from the public, from the people. This is the process that we are. You mean the new elite is rising? The up. new elite, yeah. And it's a struggle. It's a struggle between levels in the society. And. It's true. I mean, I I, I think that uh, I, I think you're right. I, I think that the people who are now speaking in the name of the Air Force are are really um, causing so much damage. And uh, and you know, and and when you're looking at this, you know, I have I have two kids who are are school boys, and they're looking at these pilots, and and you know, one of them's like, well, whatever, I want to be in the paratroopers anyway, and the other, and, you know, and like they, it used to be that kids would aspire to be pilots, and now people just say, no, I, you know, my one son wants to be in the K nine unit, the other one wants to be in uh, paratroopers, and they don't want to hear anything about pilots anymore, you know, and 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 it's uh, it's like that 
all over the place because all of these elite units are being used, whether it's there at Matkal, you know, the general staff uh, commander unit that, that the Netanyahu served in or, the, or any of these other elite units. They're all besmirching, they're ruining their, their, their brands, as they say these days, but nobody's doing it worse than the Air Force. And that leads me to the last thing that I wanted to talk about with you. Well, uh, for, uh, 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 unfortunate, unfortunately, it's not the first or the second story that I've heard about. So it's, I'm really told that. Well, I have to say in, in their defense that, you know, I've, I've never been that into the Air Force to begin with. So it's not like their parents were, were pushing them into that shit. But uh, so it's, it's not entirely because of the uh, refusers. Uh, but the other the other thing that, uh, you know, I've talked about it a lot on this uh, program in terms of the IDF and how it looks at the present warfare, the future of warfare. You know, when we look at Hezbollah, so they don't have an, they don't have F-16 and F-35 squadrons, but what they have are 150,000 missiles pointing at Israel. Our Air Force doesn't have any response to that. They, and they have an air force, it's just unmanned. Same with Hamas, you know, they have drones. I, Iran has become, they don't have a, an air force. They, you know, the, their latest planes are the 14 Tomcats that they got before the revolution in 79. And so, you know, these, these enemies that we're facing that are strategic threats to Israel, they have unmanned air forces. And we just heard, I think wrong, I think it's a crazy decision, but the, the, the Ministry of Defense, in the middle of all of this, decided that they want to get another squadron of F-35s from the United States. And I look and I say, why aren't we investing our money in, you know, a missile corps and a drone corps? You know, is the future of manned flight, is, is the future still in manned flight, or should we be looking at manned flight you know, more like the, the, the cavalry, you know, the horses corps that, that went and became heavy armor over time. I mean, do, do you see an evolution in warfare with that? How do you look at that? You know, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure of, I think that we could have won six armies in six days. And I think. But they didn't have missiles. Yeah, you're right. But I think it's a question of decisions. And if we, you know, can strengthen strengthen the the decision makers, you know, by by a moralic moral by a moral, you know, um uh, so I, I think, you know, you, you you don't deal with missiles against missiles with missiles. Why not? Why yes? What what would you do? Will you shot a missile on the uh, uh, the citizens of Lebanon. I mean, I I don't know. Like well, we're, they okay. they want to they want to level Tel Aviv into ground. Okay. You're you know, absolutely right, but we have to find a way to. We should. Why should Beirut be left standing? I don't see the moral. Okay, okay. Uh, but I don't think that you you know to shut missiles on uh, uh, on citizens in Beirut, for example, will solve the problem because the Hezbollah, even though you can say it's a moral deed to to attack uh, uh, citizens in Lebanon. So if what you're saying is that they, you're saying that you think that you still need precision uh, attacks and those are best carried out by the Air Force. Oh, I'm saying that there are, there are a lot of limits to the Air Force today. Uh, it comes derived from, from, uh, derived from Bagats. From uh, the Supreme Court. Yeah, but not just from the Supreme Court, but we have a lot, a lot of limits. And on the other side, we have a lot of strategic, um, you know, targets. And once we uh, we get those right decisions, I think we can win the war. Yeah, but with our man, with our man squadron. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we'll not just squadrons, but also yeah, and treatment, regular infantry, and right, but the whole army. Unfortunately, I think that I, I guess I I I need to I guess that there is going to be a war, and. You mean now with Hezbollah in the yeah. north? Yeah. Oh, well, it's on the ship. And you think that the pilots are going to show up for duty? Of course, no doubt. No doubt. So what you're telling me is that, and and I just want to underline and it's in our closing, you're saying that these news stories of the letters, of the 
thousands of refusers of uh, the pilots. Thousands of refusers. Thousands. 20,000 is the latest that they're threatening. Uh, pilots, special operators, uh, cyber warriors. Do you know the percentage of the reserve duty in Israel? That it's all a lie. Do you know the percentage of the reserve duty in Israel? You mean of... of 6.5. Of Israelis who serve in reserve. Yeah. So yeah. let's just, you know, assume that there is 10 million citizens. It's almost 10 million. Okay, so 6.5. It means uh, 600,000 of reserve duty. So three, half of them are not activated, okay? So... You're not active duty. Active duty, yes. So 30,000, you're talking about 10% of refusal. I haven't seen one pilot yet. So So there's nothing to worry about. I think so. I'm sure so. I sh- I think so too. I, I'm pretty sure we're being played, and and I think one of the reasons that we know we're being played, one of the one of the central reasons we know we're being played, is because of you, because you stood up and you exposed it, and so um, you guys should all know that if it hadn't been for Shai Karlach, you know, the, it, it, we would be in a different position in the discourse today because it's all run on lies and. Most people are not in a position to expose them, and you came and you stood up and you've been exposing them. So thank you very thank much you. for it's everything you've done. To serve the country and to serve Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, and we'll see you again uh, next week. I'll be uh, I'll be coming on, I think, from Chicago, and uh, we'll see you again for another Carolyn Glick show. Take care. Carolyn.